about the theory behind why opportunities present themselves in the marketplace, we're talking about really two general ideas. I mean, there's the experience where you drive along and you see an opportunity perhaps for a fast food chain or you sure wish there was a bookstore here or, um, or some ice cream parlor over there. That's sort of the practical experience. But the theory behind it says that there are two reasons why we can believe as startup companies or as people interested in beginning companies or starting a venture. There are two reasons we can believe that out of the seven or so billion dollars, billion people on the planet and the 200, 300 years of, industrialized, of living in the industrialized world, why it may be that you as an individual or you and your friends as a group might actually identify an opportunity that no one else has managed to capitalize on before. Why is that possible? Well, one of the theories behind this is put forth by uh, Israel Kushner from NYU. And his thinking is that it has to do with differences in information. Certain people have different information that comes from their experience and their background, their personal histories, their family histories and cultural histories that may allow them to observe a situation and literally see something different that other people don't see. It allows them to look around, see what everyone else is just walking past and see as if for the first time some new idea that no one else ever has seen or had the, the, not only the thought of seeing it, but also the idea about how to capitalize it, how to make things different, how to change things. And that comes from many of us being in different positions. You may be from another country or another culture. You move to another area of the country. You may be from the South. Texas, for example, you move to Long Island you realize that there are a lot of other people moving to Long Island and those from that Texas area and certain kinds of things in Texas, maybe a kind of a bar or kind of a nightclub, um, the kind of store that sells a certain type of clothing or something, which is popular in Texas but is not around. You can't find it in Long Island. You may say there's an opportunity here for this. Or you may be thinking about a technology that you've used in a different way and be talking to a group of people, maybe a different generation, older, older folks visiting perhaps a nursing home or a assisted living home visiting your grandparents, and you realize that some of the technologies that are very common to you as a kid, uh, as a young person, um, is totally foreign to them, and yet there might be, in your mind, you may see some opportunities where you can talk to your grandparents via the video or whatever in social media, and you could bring some kind of an application to them comes from your experience of having people that are in, in an assisted living kind of a, of a situation, your grandparents, and knowing about a certain aspect of technology, knowing about a new app that came out, for example, that would allow you to interact better with them. So the idea of this theory is that each of us, individually, has a unique set of experiences. So one of the things to think about when you think about finding business opportunities is to look into yourself and say, what is unique about my background, my experience, my history that might allow me to see something that others don't see? Now, normally, particularly at a young age, we're more worried about what makes us the same as other people. But in entrepreneurship, what you really want to do is think about what makes you different than other people, what makes you see things that other people might not see. Now, you've got to be careful. You don't want to be too idiosyncratic or no one else will want whatever it is you identify as your business opportunity. But if you find something that you uniquely can identify because you like a certain sport, for example, you, you very much like some sport that is not necessarily a mainstream thing, but it may have some exercise elements in it, for example, it keeps you in really good shape. And you say, maybe because I really like this particular kind of exercising, or I like exercising at high temperature, which is these sort of a, a, became a trend. That you open a studio where the temperature is, is kept at 80 degrees or 85 degrees or something like that. This is already actually happening with some kinds of uh, of gyms that are done at a high temperature. 
But you may say that's what you like, you find that out and you start opening places like that and it creates an opportunity. So you want to be reflecting on why you can see something other people can't. If everyone sees it, then somebody most likely would have tried it before. So when you see a business opportunity and you think it might be a good idea, if you're not coming from a place that's relatively unique, then certainly that person over there walking down the street thought of this too, or somebody else did yesterday or last week or five years ago, and most likely someone tried it and there's some reason that it wouldn't work. But if you're coming from a new position, a new perspective, you have a different background, uh, maybe there's a kind of food that you eat at home that isn't available in restaurants, that's a unique experience that you say, okay, maybe, maybe, just maybe, that uniqueness is something someone else didn't see and there may be a big market. That's the sort of idea that we're getting at when we talk when 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 we look at this particular perspective on where opportunities come from. It gives us hope that of the seven people in the world, seven billion people in the world, we may be the lucky one that finds this new, next new big thing. So this is one of the theoretical perspectives, and you can reflect and think about this um, quite a bit about how information and position and perspective and difference might lead to a new opportunity. The second theory, and this is one that is very important for you to remember and for you to know this particular name, Joseph Schumpeter. This is the idea of creative destruction. If things that were built 100 years ago still work today, it would be really hard to find a new opportunity. But what, does, what tends to happen is what worked yesterday, or last year, five years ago, is replaced by something new and better a new kind of technology, a disruptive technology. This is what Schumpeter calls creative destruction. Some new thing comes along and makes what used to be around obsolete. The internet comes along and it makes email to some degree, the, replaces the traditional phone, uh, the traditional mail lines, except for all the junk mail we tend to get. Something comes along and wipes out junk mail. I mean, uh, email, you know, instant messaging and chat and texting, right? Something else will come along and erase that. Once the, the playing field is leveled, people that used to have an advantage, the incumbent businesses that used to have an advantage, like the U.S. Bail Service or whatever, all of a sudden no longer has an advantage. In fact, as we'll talk about in some later lectures, they actually have a disadvantage because they're trying to protect their current position, right? They're trying to keep that going and move forward. So here, the, the Schumpeter idea is things come along and they level the playing field. They destroy the, the prior regime. Electric cars may destroy the gas-powered engine. There's people that are saying that gasoline-powered combustion engine will be look, looked at as quaint, like horse carriages um, in 10 years or 15 or 20 years. Whether that happens or not, who knows? But that's the core idea behind creative destruction that sometimes people invent things that have a whole new way, that create a whole new way of doing and thinking about the future. And those are the sorts of things that we try to find opportunities because when the, level, when the playing field is level, we can dive in and if we're smart and nimble and fast and sharp and we bring the right team and the right resources together, we have just as much chance of building the next framework, the next dominant logic use some of the terms in the, in the art here, um, as anybody else. Somebody else may beat us, but at least it's a fair fight. And that's what creative destruction creates for us. In the next discussion here, we'll start talking about where some of these opportunities come from. But don't forget, I want you to keep in mind these two different kinds of theoretical frameworks, and in particular, the one name that I want you to remember is Joseph Schumpeter and the idea of creative destruction.